uh, welcome to this lecture. In the previous lecture, we saw a brief introduction to the parameter estimation problem. What is the parameter estimation problem? You have IID samples from an underlying distribution. The distribution is characterized by a parameter. What does it mean? What, what does that mean? Like for instance, we saw Bernoulli P as a possible distribution. So the, the, we are not really looking at one distribution. We are looking at a class of distributions, Bernoulli P, Bernoulli class of distributions, but an unknown parameter P. So as you keep changing the parameter, the distribution itself changes within a certain class. Okay? So in that kind of a situation, how do you find out or estimate the value of the parameter from the samples. Okay, so that's the parameter estimation problem. We already saw that you know no one can exactly come up with an estimate just based on the samples. Okay, you should know ahead of time something else, right? If you already know the parameter ahead of time, why do you want to estimate it? You don't want to estimate it. Okay, so you want to estimate it, and the estimator is going to be a function of the samples. Samples are random variables, so function of sample is a random variable. So your estimator is a random variable. It will have a distribution. While what you are trying to estimate is a constant value, it has no distribution. Okay, so you're hoping a good estimator will have very little error. It will always predict values close to the actual value theta, right? So it's important to study the error in the estimation problem process, right? So what is the error? How do you quantify the error? What can we say about the error? Can we control the error? Can we bring it down? Can we make the probability for high values of error very low, right? Things like that is what we will study in this lecture. Okay, so let's uh, look closely at this notion of estimation error. You have a parameter theta, you have a random variable which is an estimator, right? Estimator is theta hat of x1 through xn. So you can define an error. Error we will define as the difference between what the estimator is putting out and the parameter. Right, theta hat of x1, xn minus theta, and remember this is also a random variable. Okay, theta hat itself is a random variable. We are hoping it's around theta. So theta hat of x1, xn minus theta, we are hoping will be close to zero, isn't it? We don't want very large values for the error. But nevertheless, it's a random variable. It's a distribution. It will have a certain PMF or PDF. We are hoping it's around zero. It doesn't take high values. Is what we are hoping. If, if you have a good estimator, it won't take that many high values. Okay, So that here is, here is I mean, uh, paraphrased exactly that. We are expecting that a good estimator will take values close to the actual theta, in which case the error should be very, very close to 0. So one way of precisely writing this down mathematically is, remember error is not just a number, it is a random variable. right? So you can think of probability of absolute value of the error being greater than delta should be very small. Okay, so what is uh, so 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 one part of it seems okay. Probability that the absolute value of errors is too big should be small. But how do you pick the delta, right? In an actual problem, what is a meaningful choice for delta? Right? So those are things we have to think about. We'll we'll come to it. But nevertheless, this seems like a reasonable way to approach the problem, right? So you have an estimator, which is a random uh, variable actually, and you want to characterize its error. So you go look at the distribution of the error. And you want the distribution to be such that the probability with which it takes very large values is very small, right? It's absolute values, right? So that's uh, important also. Okay, so this seems reasonable. Let's let's keep going ahead and see how to think of it. One immediate thought that comes to our mind is how to characterize delta. I mean, how how big should delta be? Okay, so there's there's ways to answer that. You can look at some uh, uh, examples. The first thing to realize is the parameter theta will have a certain range. Okay, So we will know the range. For instance, Bernoulli p, here is an example I put down. Uh, for Bernoulli p, I know that the value of p is between 0 and 1. right? So my estimator error, whatever may be the p, my estimator error must be small with respect to that p. right? See, for instance, uh, you, you might think an error of 0 0.1 is very small. Okay, Maybe you think, okay, 0 0.1 is a small number or maybe 0 0.01 is a small number. Maybe my error should not be smaller, should not be greater than 0 0.01, you may think. Okay, so maybe 0 0.01 is a, a really small error. You may say, okay, though maybe for Bernoulli p, I may take delta to be 0 0.01. But imagine what if your p value is 10 power minus 5? Okay, the actual p that you are going to likely to see, if it's 10 power minus 5, 
then your uh, you know 0 0.01 is huge compared to that okay so it's good to have the magnitude of error characterized in terms of the parameter you are estimating right so if you are estimating p you can say maybe I, I should have only 10 percent error around p okay so for instance the last thing i put down here maybe a good uh, thing to say about p is the absolute value of error should be less than or equal to p by 10 okay so that keeps the actual error within 10 percent okay so so th these kind of ideas you can use to characterize this delta okay so how big an error can you tolerate if you are trying to estimate a p which is an unknown quantity by the way if you are trying to estimate the p then the error should not be more than 10 percent of the p okay that is a reasonable way to put it right so if, if on the other hand let us say you are doing normal distribution the mean of the normal distribution can be anything right there is no restriction on that so how do you think of the error if you are estimating something you have to think of the error as a fraction of what you are estimating right if, if as a fraction of what you are estimating it is only 10 percent error or something then you can be sure that the error is small right if you, if you mean you are estimating is 1000 and if you estimate it as 1001 it is ok it is not too bad if the mean you are estimating is 0 0.1 and you are estimating it as 1.1 it is a huge error ok so, so the error usually is relative to what you are measuring and that is something to be careful about ok so usually uh, people keep that uh, keep track of it. Uh, you can think of it as a delta it is not too bad delta generally small is good but uh, keep these kind of things in mind you, you really want to characterize that error uh, as a uh, function of the parameter also ok. So this seems reasonable right so this kind of probability of absolute value of error being greater than delta should be very small that seems like a good way to characterize error in estimation and we will take that approach and see where it takes us ok. Let us come back to our example. Okay, so here is a favorite example x1 through xn is iid Bernoulli p. I have three estimators not just one I have three estimators for p. Let me start thinking about errors for uh, this estimators. Okay, what are the errors for these estimators? Uh, what is their distribution? What is the probability that the absolute value of error becomes greater than some delta? Can I characterize it for each of these, uh, uh, these uh, distributions? It turns out it is possible. Okay, so before that let us just get our feet wet a little bit let us just look at a few samplings from this uh, uh, distribution and see how our three uh, estimators are doing ok. So here are three different samples let us say from the same uh, value of p uh, you, you have first 10 samples being you know 100, 101, 1100 ok. Your p1 hat is always 0 0.5 right nothing changes ok whatever may be the sampling p1 hat is 0 0.5. What is p2 hat? it's also 0.5 what is p3 hat it's also 0.5 okay for that particular sampling that's what happened here is another sampling 100 101 0, 0100 0, 0, 0. okay here again p1 hat is 0. 0.5 p2 hat is 0. 0.5 p3 hat is 0. 0.4 okay so you see it varies uh, remember p2 hat why is it 0. 0.5 it's just 1 plus 0 by 2 right first two samples i'm adding by 2 here is another 10 samples from the third round okay another round of uh, sampling you got 1100001001 okay so you see p1 hat is always 0.5 i'm not going to change anything p2 hat becomes 1 now okay and p3 hat remains 0.5 okay so just three examples of course in the actual examples it might change a little bit here and there but just from these examples we are saying uh, immediately that p1 hat will not work for all values of p why if if p were to be uh, you know 1 for instance right so you'll just get 11111 even when you see the samples as 11111 you are going to say p1 hat p hat is 0.5 okay so that is going to give you an error only if p is very 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 close to 0.5 will it work right if it is going to be away from 0.5 the first estimator will not work okay that is obvious okay but what is the problem with this p2 hat notice how flaky p2 hat is okay sometimes it says 0.5 sometimes it says 1 it can even say 0 right if you, if you take one more sampling where the first two are 0 which can happen if the 0 is comma 0 you get p2 hat will become 0 ok. So the variation in the estimator is very very large it is going from 0 to 1 to 0.5 jumping all over the place it is not staying steady ok. So the, the p1 hat we complain saying it is always saying 0.5 it is not moving at all but at least not moving at all seems like a good <laughs> quantity to have when you compare it with p2 hat it is moving all over the place right. So this p1 hat is not able to adapt to different values of p easily but at least 
you know it doesn't keep jumping around on the other hand p2 hat maybe can adapt to different values of p but across different samplings it seems to give a wide variation okay that's also not very nice okay but p3 hat seems to be very promising right it's sort of steady uh, it maybe reacts to the samples a little bit but doesn't get too wayward and doesn't uh, seems to be seem to be disturbed so the p3 hat really is a promising uh, sort of estimator and that's uh, th th these these ideas are all quite important okay the fact that you know your estimator value itself should not keep going all over the place that's, that's sort of natural right if your estimator over different samplings is going all over the place then maybe you don't trust the estimator too much right the variation in the estimator value should not be too high at the same time it should not just be stuck at one value right if, if the underlying parameter changes it should adapt to it it should change so you should try and use all those things and uh, change so there's some like sort of tension or uh, you know give and take already that you see but this kind of analysis will help you okay so first thing that a lot of people would do is uh, given an estimation problem and given a bunch of estimators they would first simulate it right so this kind of simulation you can do you have you know for enough collab uh, notebook experiments you've seen this kind of experiment is easy to do right so you generate these samples test out the estimators and see how it is varying is it varying too much is it holding steady is it working out for different values of the unknown parameter all of that you can easily test using a uh, collab script i'll welcome you to write it uh, yourself as well okay so this is uh, estimator uh, with through this example let's continue this example okay so i wanted to measure probability that absolute value of error is greater than p by 10 right so i wanted to think about that uh, so let's look at p1 hat okay p1 hat is half which means error is half minus p right absolute value of error right absolute value of error will be absolute value of half minus p right so that is the error and here i've plotted uh, half minus p absolute value of half minus p it will look like this no absolute value of half minus p okay hopefully you can see this and then i've also plotted on the same picture p by 10 okay so you can see this is p by 10 this is p by 10 that's uh, absolute value of error hopefully you can see that and you can see the absolute value of error is most of the time for most values of p it is above p by 10 only between these two values which you can calculate i've calculated it there uh, this value is 5 by 11 this value is 5 by 9 okay only between 5 by 11 and 5 by 9 when value of p is very close to 0.5 you have the absolute value of error falling below uh, p by 10 for all other values it's above okay that's number one number two error is actually constant there's no randomness there so probability that error is greater than p by 10 is just equal to 1 okay so it's probability 1 if p is either less than 1 5 by 11 or p is greater than uh, 5 by 9 so this part any value of p here or here is totally bad for you okay so you see this analysis this um, uh, pro absolute value of error being p by greater than p by 10 is, is true for a large range of p except for uh, p around uh, 0.5 okay so the first estimator is sort of uh, not so good you can say it's, it's it's not behaving the way we expect it to behave okay let's go to the second estimator second estimator or x was x1 plus x2 by 2 now this is a you know you can write a table here right so x1 is the first value x2 is the second value the error itself is x1 plus x2 by 2 minus p okay you can look at the absolute value if you want okay and then you can find the probability that the error equals e right so 1 minus p squared etc etc okay so again you can calculate this i'm not going to go through the details here you can see you can plot all these guys versus p by 10 and compare when they go below above etc so you can see for most values of p the values of p less than 5 by 11 or above 5 by 9 and less than 10 by 11 this probability will be equal to 1 okay so the probability of the error being greater than 10 percent is equal to 1 for a large range of p in the second uh, estimator as well okay so you see the first estimator second estimator we had a bad feeling about these estimators from the simulations and it's confirmed in the analysis also okay so they're quite bad uh, in, in performance okay so so look at this later I, I know i didn't go into great detail in explaining to you how this works uh, think about how this distribution came about but intuitively it's clear right you're using only the first two samples you're not really going to get error performance that's great look at the third one the third one is like i said a really really good estimator there's lots of uh, good reasons how uh, how we can justify it later on also we'll justify it more and more but for now let's look at our calculation of probability of absolute value of error being greater than p by 10 
can I control it in the third estimator? You see, you will get a very surprising and powerful result with the third estimator, which is very, very desirable for that property. Okay. So, notice P3 hat is x1 plus x2 plus xn divided by n. So, the error is just x1 plus xn divided by n minus p. Right? That is your error. Now, let us recall our wonderful, wonderful Chebyshev bound. Right? So, like I have been mentioning to you that these bounds are not just idle tools. They are very, very useful in actual problems. So, the Chebyshev bound tells you, pro see error is a random variable. Right? I am going to use the Chebyshev bound on the error random variable. Probability of absolute value of error minus expected value of error greater than delta is less than or equal to variance of error by delta square. Remember, error is a random variable. Okay, So, this is a random variable and you use Chebyshev on that random variable Okay, and you get this. right? So, usually we write uh, probability of mod x minus expected value of x greater than delta. right? So, x is error. Right? That is all. Error is my random variable and I have uh, this calculation. So, what is expected value of error? Right? If you, if you calculate it, remember it is all linear, right? You use linearity of expectation. This will go just expected value of x1, expected value of xn. Each of them is p, right? What is expected value of x1? It is p, right? x1 is Bernoulli p, right? Expected value of x1 is p, expected value of x2 is p, so on. Each of these expected values is p. So, np by p minus p and this will become 0. Okay? So, this is an exercise for you. Check this. Okay? So, it is an easy enough calculation. So, the expected value of error becomes 0. Okay? So, this uh, turns out as a good property. Okay? Why is this a good property? For any estimator, on average it should give you 0 error. right? Error is a random variable. Agreed. Right? So, it is a random variable. It, its distribution is going to be around 0 and you, uh, you want the average value of the error to be close to 0. Okay? So, it, it cannot have an error which is always non-zero in some sense. right? So, there should not be any uh, non-zero residue in the error all the time. It, on average, it should sort of cancel out and give you 0 error. So, this seems like a desirable property and this uh, estimator has it. In fact, uh, the other estimators also have it. We will come back to it. Uh, the variance of the error also is something that you can determine. Okay? So, the variance of this we have determined it before. You, you go through and calculate. Remember, x1 through xn are all independent random variables, they are all Bernoulli p, you know how to calculate it. The variance will come out to be p times 1 minus p by n. Okay? So, think about why this comes. We have done this calculation multiple times before. That is why I am sort of rushing it through. Go back and look at how we calculated variance of IID samples, sums of IID samples and all that. Right? So, from there you will see for this Bernoulli distribution, the variance will come out to be p times 1 minus p by n. So, once you do this, it is easy to use the above bound and calculate probability of error greater than p by 10. Remember, this guy became 0 and this was uh, p times 1 minus p divided by n. right? So, that is what I put here. Okay? The variance is just p times 1 minus p divided by n. Okay? And instead of delta, I have put p by 10. p by 10 is what I wanted for delta. right? So, you will have delta square is p squared by 100. Some cancellations will happen. And you will get this value for probability that absolute value of error is greater than p by 10. This is true for any p, whatever your p may be, probability that the absolute value of error is greater than p by 10, I can upper bound as 100 times 1 minus p by np. So, what is the big upshot of this result? You may have learnt about limits and other things in your mathematics too. What is the limit of this quantity as n becomes larger and larger? it goes to 0. I can make it as small as I want it to be. Whatever may be the value of the other things, I can make this guy go as small as I want just by increasing in n. Okay? So, some of you who understood the Chebyshev bound, Chernoff bound, concentration results, etc., would be able to quickly see here, if instead of using Chebyshev, I were to use Chernoff or something else which is stronger, I am going to get an exponential fall with n, not just a 1 by n. Right? from your limits and other notion of functions, you may know the 1 by n is sort of a slow fall. e power minus cn can be a very fast fall. Okay? So, you can have an exponential decrease in n also possible. Okay? Now, there is lots of meaning in this slide. So, I want to take up a little bit more time and think about this very carefully. Okay? So, here is an estimator which I have been arguing is a good estimator for multiple reasons. Seems reasonable. It is using all the samples. And more importantly, its performance 
is improving with the number of samples n. Okay, so I want to repeat that once again. It's a crucial, crucial, crucial idea that you have to grasp. Okay, so any estimator that you want to come up with, you are expecting that it will use samples. When you have more samples, the performance of the estimator should be better, isn't it? If I give you 10 samples or if I give you 20 samples, when, you give, when I give you 20 samples, the estimate that you get should be better than what you get with 10 samples. And if I give you 200 samples, it should be even better. If I give you 2000 samples, it should be even, even better. Okay? As you get more and more information about the underlying samples through underlying distribution through the independent identical samples, your estimation process should use all the samples and put out an estimate whose accuracy should keep on improving with n. As you get more samples, you should get more accuracy. Or other way around, if you get more and more samples, your error should keep falling. Right? That's what you expect. But if you see the P1 hat and P2 hat, n never showed up anywhere. Right? Probability that error became greater than P by 10 was just 1 for some cases. Right? So there's no n. Here, we're able to make n appear in these probabilities and not only appear, it appears in a certain way such that for any value of the parameter, this kind of probability goes to 0 with increasing n. Okay? So this gives us a very good feeling about this estimator, doesn't it? Right? Whatever may be the value of p, I can just keep taking more and more and more samples. Once I take enough samples, I can be very confident that my absolute value of error is not too large. Right? So you can put in some values here for p and then get a good bound and be happy about what kind of values you can expect for the error. Okay? So this is a good property and this is something very, very important. You want to build estimators which use or samples, all right, that's good, but they should also result in performance which improves with n okay, in some reasonable fashion. Okay? That's an important uh, story that came here and notice the power of the Chebyshev bound. It was so useful, isn't it, to give you uh, this nice uh, behavior that you had. Okay? So here are a few summary observations. Various estimators are possible. Okay? Valid estimators, there are infinitely many. Okay? Every estimator will have an error and that error will be random. It will have a certain distribution. You are hoping that that error has a distribution around 0, uh, maybe expected value is 0, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it has very small error, maybe its variance is small and the distribution itself is not very widespread. With samples, you are expecting that the distribution will get smaller and smaller and smaller, probability that it becomes large is uh, negligible, etc. So, so really, we, we saw that the probability that absolute value of error is greater than delta is a very useful way of uh, characterizing the uh, uh, estimator in a good design. These probabilities will fall with n. Okay? How fast they fall with n depends on how good your estimator is. Maybe you can do even among the good estimators, you can do different designs to make these probabilities fall faster, faster with n. You know, things like that are uh, interesting topics for investigation. Okay, so this is the first observation. The Chebyshev bound is a very useful tool. You can also use the other concentration and other results. We'll come back and look at those kind of tools if at all we need them. But even Chebyshev is good enough, right? So notice uh, this expression. From this expression, if you're, if you're looking at absolute value of error not being too large, then it seems it's a very good idea to make expected value of error be equal to zero. Okay, so it looks like uh, good design principles you can just derive from these kind of equations, right? The first one is you're, you're seeing immediately that you want the expected value of error to be close to zero. If it's close to zero, then probability of absolute value of error greater than delta I can bound uh, very very well. Okay, not only that, this variance of the error, right? Which, uh, which shows up on the right hand side, I want, to, want it to tend to 0 as well with n. Okay? So I want to design an estimator with, uh, with an eye on the expected error, the variance of the error and things like that. Okay? So you want to control the behavior of the expected value of the error, you want it to go to 0, variance of the error hopefully uh, should also fall with n. Okay? So uh, hopefully in this lecture I have convinced you that Estimators will give you errors, the errors will have a distribution and with a larger and larger number of samples, you can control the magnitude of the error in the distribution. The probability with which the error becomes very large can be controlled uh, through some tools like Chebyshev and all that. So this gives you good design principles. You want to focus on the expected error, you want to focus on variance of error, magnitude square, expected value of error and things like that. Okay? So those are the things 
we will look at in the next lecture and subsequently we will see good ways of uh, designing estimators. Okay? Thank you very much.